Welcome back to my channel, Recovering Your Health with Nutrition. And if this is your first time visiting, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Ife and I'm a licensed family nurse practitioner. Preventative medicine is my passion. And here we talk all things health and wellness. Now, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and I wanted to share some insights that I think everyone should know. According to the American Cancer Society, every two minutes, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer in the US. One out of eight women will develop invasive breast cancer over the course of her lifetime. This year, breast cancer actually became the most common cancer globally. According to the World Health Organization, it overtook lung cancer, which was in the number one spot. According to the American Cancer Society, white women are slightly more likely to develop breast cancer more than African American women. And in women under 45 years of age, breast cancer is more common in black women and black women are more likely to die of breast cancer at any age. Asians, Hispanics, and Native Americans have a lower risk of developing and dying from breast cancer. The model of medicine that we use in the U.S. typically focuses on screening for early detection, diagnosis, and treatment. Screening is very important. The current guidelines recommend that women initiate screening at the age of 40. If you have a family history of breast cancer, you would start the screening process sooner. So what would constitute a family history? It would be you having a first degree relative, like a parent, a sibling, a child, or you have two or more other relatives, like a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, niece or nephew, that has been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. So that would qualify you as having a higher risk for uh, developing breast cancer yourself. What usually happens after we get our results, preferably it's um, insignificant or negative for malignancy, you usually don't even think about a mammogram again until the next year or until you're questioned about it at your wellness visit. So just to reiterate, my passion is preventative medicine and the reason why I created this channel is to help change the way we think about our health, our health care, and also most importantly the role that we play. I want you to take the driver's seat when it comes to your health. This year has been a very tough year for everyone. You know, among other things, healthcare disparities have become more apparent. And not only that, but just the cracks in general in our healthcare system. So the way that our healthcare process is structured, we focus on early detection, which is evidence-based, it's wonderful, it's great, but we don't focus as much as we need to on prevention. In fairness to us healthcare providers, we just don't have the time we need to spend in the office. It's typically like a 15 minute visit um, and then we have to keep it moving. But um, even in, in school, even in our education, we are not really taught in depth um, the benefits of nutrition or the benefits of healthy lifestyle. And I think that needs to change. Not I think, I know that needs to change. Anyways, I, I truly believe if I were to ask some of my MD colleagues, they would say the same thing or feel the same way. So my goal in making this video is to help you think about breast cancer awareness in another light. I want you to become aware of the things you can do to reduce your chances of developing breast cancer. And if you are already diagnosed, I want to encourage you to explore the power of nutrition to aid in your treatment process in tandem with your personal treatment plan that you have uh, most likely already established with your personal health care provider. So I'm going to condense as much information as possible in this video and if need be I'll make a part two, three, four, five, we'll have a series on breast cancer, okay? But um, I want you to be, you know, I want you to be equipped. I want you to have the ammunition you need to do the things that you need for you and your family to lower your risk of development. And for us women of color, the stats aren't in our favor. We die at higher rates from breast cancer, so we really have to, you know, assess our habits, assess our patterns, and to see where we can make changes for the better. 
Okay, so let's discuss the cancer process in a nutshell. Professor Campbell from Cornell University does a wonderful job discussing this topic. Cancer process can be divided into three phases. So I want you to listen intently as you can to this and really everyone should know this so please share. There are three phases in the cancer process. The first phase is called initiation. Second phase is promotion and the third is progression. In the first phase of initiation, that's when we are exposed to carcinogens. We don't live in a bubble, so we will most likely not be able to avoid exposure. Carcinogens are present everywhere. They're found in the foods we eat, chemicals we use. Um, they also can, carcinogens can be viruses such as HPV, hep, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, the Epstein-Barr virus, and then free radicals. They can also act as an initiator or even in the second phase of the cancer process act as a promoter. So that's why we need to eat a diet that's high in antioxidants. So carcinogens, what are, what are carcinogens? Carcinogens causes damage to our cells. So they enter the cell and then they alter our cellular DNA leading to mutations. Fortunately, our bodies are equipped with a built-in cellular repair process and the majority of our damaged cells are repaired. However, there are some cells that have been mutated um, that are able to replicate before repair can take place. And so once replication takes place, then the mutation is fixed. And so now that mutated cell or affected cell goes on into phase two, which is promotion. So the mutated cell now advances to the second phase, which is promotion, and this is a phase that I really want you to take note of. During this phase, the mutated cells um, are able to form clusters if the environment is conducive. If, 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 if. If the environment is right, then the mutated cells are able to form clusters and those clusters can ultimately form tumors and that's the, those are the masses and the tumors that we detect during screening. So I wonder, I, I, hope that, I hope you're really seeing what the issues are with our healthcare system, you know, because in a wellness visit, we start with screening. We're screening for a tumor. We're screening for a mass, okay? And so we're already starting we're behind, we're behind, we're, we're starting at phase three and we're not putting enough attention into the initiation phase and into the promotion phase. So for the sake of the discussion, let's say that the environment was right, was conducive for this mutated cell to grow, to form clusters and to eventually form the tumor. Once the tumor is formed, it advances to the third and the final phase, which is called progression. So during this phase, the tumor can now, it, you know, metastasize. So it, what does that mean? It starts in one area of the body and now it was able to spread. So in our current medical model, we focus on screening. I want you to really, really soak that in because this is why it's so important for you to take the lead in your health. We focus on screening, early detection, diagnosis, and treatment, and we're giving more attention, as stated before, to phase three versus phase one and two. So when tumors are found on mammography, we are already behind. But what about phase one and two? Okay, the promotion phase typically lasts from years to decades. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that, and I'm gonna say it as slow as possible. The promotion phase typically lasts from years to decades. So we have time to make sure that we don't create an environment that will encourage cancer growth. So you heard me correctly, the promotion phase lasts from years to decades. So in this phase, there's even, you know, there's, there's research that has been done that shows that the, the, the effects of the carcinogen can be reversed. Studies also show that we can create an environment in our body that does not promote cancer growth. So there was a study that was done on mice and they were exposed to a certain carcinogen. So the mice were separated into two groups. Both groups were exposed to the same level of carcinogen, the same amount of carcinogen. I think it was aflatoxin. 
um, if I remember correctly. However, one group was only fed a 5% Cassian protein diet. Um, in other words, let me make that more clear. One group was given only 5% of Cassian protein in their diet. And so Cassian protein is the, the major protein that we find in dairy milk. The second group was given 20% Cassian protein. Now they both have the same exposure to uh, the carcinogen, but the results showed that in the group that had, had uh, a higher level of the Cassian protein, they developed cancer at a higher rate. Okay, so what does this tell us? Yes, carcinogens cause cancer, but they also need the proper environment to flourish, uh, flourish, to flourish. See, it was a flourish is a mix of thrive and flourish, flourish. But anyways, they, they need the, the the proper environment to to grow. All right, so I like to think of the analogy of the seed. The seed has everything it needs to, let's, let's say an apple seed. The apple seed has everything it needs in that seed to become the tree uh, bearing fruit that we can enjoy. However, if that tree is not, um, excuse me, if the seed is not placed in the proper environment, then that seed, that tree won't come to flourishing. That seed won't grow because the environment is not conducive for growth. And that is the exact thing that the science is showing us that if we don't provide an environment for cancer to grow in our bodies, then it won't grow, it won't work. Even in the presence of the carcinogen, it won't work. Okay, so that's really something to think about. I want you, during this month of breast cancer awareness, I want you to be aware of that. And I want you to share that information because it's so key. We, we have, um, we have some power. We have some power. We are not just going to lay down and just take it from this cancer thing. We can do things. Uh, we can do the things that we need to do to make changes, okay, in those stats. I don't like those stats. Why? Well, I mean, I don't like it in general, but I just happen to be a, a you know, a woman of color and I don't like how that that doesn't set right with me. So that there's something that we can do, and that's really take a, a, a deeper look at the things that we consume. The American Cancer Society and the World Health Organization, get this, they both list processed meats, and it's right on their website, you can check it out. Um, processed meats would be considered your hot dogs, your sausage, your bacon, your corned beef, foods that are preserved by uh, assaulting process or adding chemical preservatives as a group one, the highest level of a carcinogen, okay? As a group one carcinogen. And red meat is listed as a 2A carcinogen. And according to the American Cancer Society, at least on their webpage, at least on their webpage, they recommend, guess what they recommend? A diet rich in plant foods because, and I quote, the evidence suggests that eating vegetables and fruits may lower the risk. So nutritional imbalance has been shown to promote cancer. So if you have been exposed to carcinogens and unfortunately that those cells were not able to be repaired and they go on to the promotion phase, if you are out of balance in terms of your nutritional health, then that is creating an environment for the cancer to flourish and, um, and grow. So some factors that act as promoters are this, chronic inflammation, hypertension, especially uncontrolled hypertension, high cholesterol levels, alcohol consumption, excess weight, and hormonal imbalances. So hormonal imbalances such as excess estrogen is a carcinogen. So if we have too much ex ex estrogen levels in our body, then we are creating an environment that will cause um, mutated breast cells to develop into cancer. So even our fat cells produce estrogen. Okay, gut health, and I, and I will devote a special video just on gut health because gut health is key and it's important and we are, there's so much we can do to create a healthy gut. 
all right? So gut health and a healthy liver are directly linked to proper estrogen metabolism. Actually, 50% of estrogen is metabolized in the liver and a healthy gut is important in lowering the risk for breast cancer. So how do we get a healthy gut? In a nutshell, eating a hormone balancing diet. It's gonna have a positive effect on your gut health. Uh, there's an actual, there's a healthy bacteria called estrobolome. And again, in the video that I'll do on gut health, I'll talk more about estrobolome, but it plays an essential role in regulating estrogen levels, okay? Um, so foods that we need to eat to balance our hormones, we need prebiotic foods. So we're probably more familiar with probiotics, but we also need to consume prebiotics intentionally. So prebiotic foods, uh, they're rich in something called inulin, I-N-U-L-I-N, inulin, and it helps to promote growth of the beneficial bacteria. Garlic um, fits the category, asparagus, bananas, onions, greens, artichokes, soybeans, dandelion root, chicory roots, leeks, barley, oats, apples, and guess what? Dark chocolate, yes, dark chocolate. So definitely get your prebiotics in. Also take a probiotic. Uh, if, you, if you don't already take probiotics, that's something that you can start right away to promote gut health. Go to your local store and get a probiotic and just start taking it as soon as you can. Also, you gotta eat foods high in fiber. Now remember, fiber is only found in plants. And I, just on the flip side, if, the, if it was a flip side, cholesterol is only found in animal products. Okay, that's just a little side note. So, um, just, just a little side note. So that when we were trying to lower our cholesterol, then you gotta lower the amount of animal products that you consume. But anyways, fiber is only found in plants, but it helps to feed the healthy bacteria. So um, estrobolone needs fiber, that's its food. So we gotta feed our healthy gut bacteria in order for them to, to thrive and to um, do what they need to do. And to, Fiber helps to balance the levels of estrogen in our bodies. And so some great sources, fiber, among other things, avocados and grapefruits are proven to be excellent choices in doing that. Cruciferous vegetables, um, such as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, not only do these vegetables regulate gut bacteria, they keep the fiber coming because they're loaded with fiber as well. And they also help to support detoxification of our hormones. So to recap, inflammation, uncontrolled blood pressure, cholesterol levels, alcohol consumption, excess weight, um, hormonal imbalances, they are all promoters, okay? And guess what? They're linked in some way to nutrition. Now, I don't wanna discount genetics, but genetics, you know, from the, from the research, nutrition is playing a greater role in the development of cancer and, and chronic diseases or what we call disease of affluence. A lot of it is linked to nutrition. I think some studies show that it's like 80 to 90 percent uh, what we eat is the cause of the diseases and the cancers that we have. So, but genetics, they do play a role, but we don't want to use genetics as a crutch. You know, we don't want to just say it runs in our family. You know, I had um, hypertension and I'm working on that. That's what actually kind of led me into a more whole food, plant-based way of eating. And I'm seeing wonderful results. So if you haven't listened to my intro video, please do that and you can get more details as to my journey into uh, plant-based eating. But hypertension runs in my family and so my parents had it and some of my siblings had it and then I ended up developing it. But what else runs in the family? I see that pan of mac and cheese. That pan of mac and cheese runs in the family too. Mm-hmm. That cake runs in the family. That, that Those barbecue ribs run in the family. Come on, there's a lot of things that's running around in the family that we don't need to run around in the family because it's creating an environment that's not healthy for our bodies, all right? And so I was just thinking the other day about the concept of generational wealth. Yes. But in addition to that, what about the concept of generational health and leaving a legacy of wellness, all right? So a lot of things are passed down, not just diseases, 
okay but the cause of disease is passed down to us too so we got to start thinking of you know how can we make the mac and cheese a little healthier how can we make it better can we substitute the dairy butter for plant-based butter right there you're lowering cholesterol right can we choose a healthier pasta versus a refined and processed pasta can we choose a whole wheat pasta can we do half and half and use plant-based uh, cheeses and you know if you still want a little bit of the taste of the regular every little change every little um, you know anything that you do in the right direction is going to benefit your health your health so you don't want to you don't want to look down on, on changes that um, in any positive change that you make so just you know get creative in your kitchen let's and then share your recipes with us get creative you know how can we make that cake healthier how can we make that dish healthier do we really need um, to use the the uh, ingredients that we're using how can we still enjoy culturally the foods that we love but in a healthier way so that i want to get your mind working in that direction and one thing that you can do because i did that even before i went plant-based uh, I started using a plant-based butter. One of the, the um, I found a few now, and I'll post pictures of it on my Instagram. So if you're not following me on Instagram, please do so. It's at Dine on Plants, but it's Earth's Balance. I mean, it tastes wonderful and doesn't have any cholesterol in it. And you can use that in your mac and cheese, okay? So let's just be, be more mindful um, during this month as we reflect on those of our loved ones that um, or uh, ourselves that have been affected by breast cancer let's just you know um, reflect take the time to reflect on the things that we can do to make changes okay so stay tuned for part two there's so much more to discuss on this topic um, i hope you got some value out of my video and if you did Please like and share, comment as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please do so and hit that notification bell so that you can be in the know when the next video is released. Thank you so much. And until next time, please stay well. Thank you.